Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. In the IT field, one of the most important things that you can get is good troubleshooting skills. How do you get good troubleshooting skills? Every time a person comes to you with a problem on their phone, on their tablet, their iPad, at their workstation, help them solve the problem. You will make many mistakes. Hear me carefully. That will happen. But if you will stay at it and every problem that someone brings to you, you will try and help them solve it. You will gain more and more experience in troubleshooting. There's no other way to gain that experience. So when people have problems, remember, non-technical users don't know what to do. They will bring it to a technical person. Try to solve that problem. Even if you make a mistake, keep learning, learn from that mistake, and keep on going. That's how you get good at troubleshooting. Now I have one more career tip for you, and hear me out. I'm on YouTube. There are people listening to me from India, from Indonesia, from the United States. So this doesn't apply to everybody. But if you're in the United States, you're in a major city, and you're hired in IT, do not stay with that company more than three or four years. Otherwise, you are stagnating. You are dying. The only way to get the skills and the experience is move to other companies. Not only will you get a pay raise, but you'll gain the experience that makes you valuable as your career career progresses. Now, if you're in Kansas and you're in a small city and there's two IT employers, okay, try to get hired with the other one. That's, or if you're in South America and it's just not a possibility, then this advice doesn't apply to you. So with all that said, if you're in the U.S. and you're in a major city, don't let your technical skills die in a job. So here we see a picture that's worth a thousand words or a graphic that's worth a thousand words. Notice the blue box. You see the process and we we see executable code, environmental variables, security context, and virtual address space. Remember we talked about that two terabyte virtual address space. Those are resources that are given to the threads. Notice that the threads are kind of containerized in them, but they do share address space. They do share security context. So there are certain things that threads share while they're running inside the process. So here's another picture that I love because it's just a great way of viewing what we've been talking about. Look at the disk. You've got a program on the disk. The user double clicks. The process is launched and put into RAM. The process, depending on the application, it may have one process, it may have two. It's going to make the threads of that process available to the scheduler, and then it's going to go to the CPU to be executed. This is a great picture of what happens with applications. Now, in the early days of computing, there were very few processes that had multi-thread. The reason was simple. Our CPUs were single core. There was no reason for developers to develop a process with multi-threads. But as CPUs began to advance and add hyper-threading, multiple cores, developers had to wrestle with the complex job of taking their single-threaded uh, processes and designing multi-threaded processes. So in the early days, a process was single-threaded. You had a single core for your CPU. It was straightforward. This Intel Pentium 4 was the first CPU that came out with two logical cores. Nobody could take really advantage of it as far as process is concerned, but there it was. It was the beginning. Now here's an i9 and it has 20 cores. So applications or processes that have lots of threads can really leverage a multi-core processor. So adding cores to a processor for a software developer is like adding lanes into a highway. They can get a lot more done in the same amount of time. Another interesting concept with processes is that they're a child-parent relationship. So if I have a process that initiates or creates 
another process. One becomes a parent and one becomes a child. Look at my Brave browser. You can see I've got a parent process and a whole, whole lot of child processes. This is something that Process Explorer and Process Hacker will show us. So here is Edge running in Windows 11, and you can definitely see this is my parent process, and then the indentation, it shows me all the child processes. But who is the process that's the parent of this one? We can go open, go to Properties, and under Image, we'll see down here that Explore.exe is the parent of Edge. Almost every process has a parent. This can be real helpful when I want to terminate an application. So for example, if I want to terminate the Edge browser, I can come up here, right mouse click, and notice I have the ability to kill just one process or terminate one process. Or I can come down and say, I want to kill the parent and all the child processes below. Be very, very careful. Terminating a process can lose data. So if you've got a user who's got Word and it's locked up and you're about to terminate it, you want to make sure you get a pair of some Kleenex or something that they can cry in because they're probably going to lose some data. Now let's go back to this concept. Notice Explorer is the parent process of everything in this list. Process Hacker, Process Explorer, Snipping Tool, Microsoft Edge, OneDrive. So if I kill this process and the tree, in other words, all the child processes, it's going to wipe out everything I have that's running. So let's go ahead and do it. Are you sure you want to do this? And I've got a clean desktop. Let's go back to some basics. If I come up to Jane's desktop, I'm working on her desktop, and I pop in my flash drive, and there's Process Explorer, and I simply double click and launch it. It's going to run under the security context of Jane not me. And so I may or may not have all the features and functionality that I want. So make sure you run it under administrative rights. Now here I've launched Process Hacker and you'll notice at the bar it shows I'm logged on with John who is the user at this time but I have elevated the credentials so I see John plus administrator. So that's how I know this particular tool is running under elevated credentials. With Process Explorer I right mouse click run as administrator and we'll see the same thing at the top bar, John and running under administrative rights. So be sure to do that. Otherwise, certain functionality won't work. Now, both Process Hacker, the developers that wrote that tool, and Mark Rasinovich knew the importance of color coding processes based on categories. So it's very important that we start learning the categories of different processes and the colors that are associated. This is a powerful feature in both Process Explorer and Process Hacker. Anytime a process is launched or created, Created, it gets a green color. Anytime a process is terminated, it gets a red color. Any process that is launched under your logon gets a, I guess, a blue color. It's called owned process. All services with Process Explorer are pink. So it's easy to identify in Process Explorer and Process Hacker which processes are services. Now here's some good ones. Suspended processes. These always refer to UWP applications, things that you install from the Windows Store, because they can be suspended so they don't use up CPU time and they don't use up battery. If you see a process in your Process Explorer, but it's got a dark gray color, it's simply suspended. It's not using up battery. It's not using CPU time. Packed images are ones you want to pay attention to. Many times malware exposes only the code that it wants to execute and it hides the rest of the code in compressed or encrypted form. So if you see that bright purple, you know you want to pay attention to it. Now, with that said, every packed image is not malware. There are applications that want to hide into intellectual property. And so they use this technique of encrypting or compressing portions of their code so it's harder to reverse engineer. So just be aware not everything that's packed is a malware. One of the unique issues that you can face is the creation and termination of processes at a high rate. This is typically a, a misbehaving application that has a process being created and terminated and created and terminated very fast. With the refresh rates of both of these tools, they're set at one second. So a lot of times if you've got a 
performance issue and you've got this creation termination creation termination going on you're never going to see it mark and the developers of process hacker have designed a way of keeping the color of any process that's being created and terminated on longer if that's happening you're still going to be able to see it so it's very important if i go to view you can see my update speed is about one second i can change it now if i want to change my duration of colors i go to options i go to my difference highlight duration and you want to set notice by default that's one second you want to pump that up to about five to seven seconds and that will help you find those kinds of misbehaving processes in process hacker it's already set by default if i go to options and i go to highlight notice i already have a good 10 second highlight duration already by default so you really don't have to do anything with process hacker but you probably want to go to system internals process explorer and adjust that so there's more types of processes and these are illustrated by colors there's one that called relocated dll's this is when we choose the dll view only and i'll show you that later on we can choose the the job color so it highlights any processes that are being impacted by a job object if it's a net process it will highlight it in yellow immersive processes those that are typically the windows store or uwp apps it will indicate by the teal color and then protected processes are processes that are even administrators cannot mess with these processes so here i'm looking at process explorer and you can see all the teal colored processes these are foundational processes that are used when you run any kind of windows store app or uwp app keep in mind Microsoft is moving more and more of its code to UWP structures. So this is going to continue to grow, not shrink. You say, well, I'm not going to download anything from Windows Store. Microsoft has already got a ton of UWP apps already built in. Notice I've pulled explorer.exe. Notice it's teal color. Now let's go to colors. Not every color is turned on. If you notice in the color options, some of these are just unchecked. Let's look at protected. And I'm going to any protected process going to get rid of .NET and say OK and scroll back up and there you see that bright bright red that is a process that is protected so Microsoft has very special security context to those processes that make it even as an administrator I probably can't do very much with those processes now you may not realize but in Vista the concept of a protected process was first brought forth and it was really to protect music and video content so the whole concept of protected process was really about digital rights management but over time Microsoft moved to using that technology to protect its system processes in the XP days XP towards the end of its life was absolutely being hammered by exploits and viruses and worms and everything under the Sun so Microsoft as it looked at Vista made some dramatic changes in the architecture of Windows processes are assigned to a session and in XP everybody was in one session so when Vista came up for redesign they decided to make some major architectural changes and here's what they did when you boot up your PC you've got services running you've got a lot of stuff running when you boot up you haven't logged on yet all of that processes and services are put into session zero when you log on a new session is created and it's called session one all of your processes are put in that session there is a security security boundary between everything running in session zero and everything running in session one. This is an important concept. So I'm going to go to Process Explorer and I'm going to come up to my columns and right mouse click and I'm going to select and add a new column. Now under Process Image, there are lots of things that I can add to my view in Process Explorer. The same is true with Process Hacker. One of the things that I'm going to do is the session. I'm going to add that. Another cool feature is I can click on this session column and slide it over. But notice, look at my sessions. Everything that's zero here in Process Ex Explorer is things that were running when it booted up. Then as I scroll down, I see some items 
items that are session one. That's when John logged on. Get down here. So these are the session when John logged on to this virtual machine. That is the session that was created for the John logon. Now notice I have a session two. With a virtual machine, I do a type of terminal service into this box. And notice I now have a third session that's called session two. So I have session zero, session one, and session two. All of those sessions are separated from each other in an effort to build barriers of protection.